Thank you, Alexander. So just before I came up here, we were just talking about this is a great opportunity for me because I'm trying to learn German and my pronunciation is really bad. So I'm going to throw out some German words, and however many of you laugh, then I'll know if it's really bad pronunciation or not. It's like an inverse correlation. So, Mitfahrgelegenheit. Oh. Yeah? <laughs> okay. That was, yeah, my wife decided to prioritize that over other words. The second word she taught me was Zim, Zala, Bim, Bamba, Zala, Du, Zala, Dim. <laughs> is that useful? I spent like two weeks learning that before she told me, oh, it doesn't mean anything. It's like, okay. And my favorite word, we were talking about this, is the word for shoelaces in German, schnurzenkel. It sounds like a monster that eats children. I want to write a children's book where there's like a schnurzenkel that lives in a tree that just drops down on children and just eats them. And I want to publish it in Germany and children will never put their shoes on again. Anyway, so we're not here to, to learn German. We're here to talk about split testing. So... Another distraction before we get started, I wanted to talk about Frank and George. So Frank and George are two firefighters who were introduced in a Stanford University study many years ago. And in this study, the university took a whole bunch of students and they split them into two groups. There was Frank's group and there was George's group. And then Frank's group heard all about Frank. They heard how he was a... Uh, like mid-30s, had a child, played sports at the weekends, and that during his, his firefighting work, he was very cautious, he was very risk-averse, he always played it safe. And they heard about how Frank was a fantastic firefighter. The other firefighters looked up to him, and they wanted to be like Frank, he was going to get promotion, he was in line to get medals, he was just a really great firefighter. Then the other group, George's group, heard how he also was very cautious. He also played it safe in firefighting scenarios, like avoided risk, but George was a really bad firefighter. He was on the brink of losing his job. The other firefighters didn't want to talk to him. It was a really bad situation. So the, the two groups of students learned about Frank and George, and then they were told, ah, we made it all up. There is no Frank, there is no George. Said, okay. Then they were asked, okay, so if you had to evaluate how risk-averse do you think a firefighter should be to be a good firefighter, what do, you think they sh what do you think? Frank's group had heard about this firefighter who was very risk-averse, he was very cautious, and he was a really good firefighter. They said, yeah, firefighters should be very cautious. George's group had heard about a firefighter who was very cautious but was a poor firefighter, said, oh no, firefighting's a, a risky business, it's a risky job, you've got to embrace the risk, you can't steer away from it. And the point here is that they'd been told that George and Frank didn't exist at this point. They'd been told everything they were basing their decision off was entirely made up. But they still fell very neatly into two groups. Frank's group thought they should be cautious, George's group should they be... Like, risk, like, embrace the risk. And the point here is that it's a, a cognitive bias that we see over and over and over again. We see that people learn something, or they think they learn something, and they observe something, and they can't let it go. And so then they say, oh, yeah, I've seen this before, and they map it to everything else. And they ignore data that doesn't agree with their, their principles. Like in George's and Frank's case, these were alternative facts. This was fake news. They knew this, but they still embraced it, and they still avoided. Once they heard it, it was fictional. They just still had that cognitive belief. And so we do this. How many of you here, this is going to be like an age test for the audience, how many of you here, by show of hands, have recommended out attributes for images uh, SEO, or for SEO at any point? So maybe two-thirds of you, half of you? And so, yeah, like, this is something that, if you, certainly if you've been in the industry for a while, this is something that was always talked about. You had to have out attributes, and any good guide to SEO talked about how you needed to do out attributes for SEO, and that's important, and you still see this bantered around in a lot of guides. And so, in the old days, maybe it did matter, but we haven't updated our beliefs, but we've got this cognitive bias. We've seen this work, it's got to be right. So, we tested this. I'll explain how these graphs work later on, but in this case, you can see that this is flat. We rolled out and tested objectively exactly what impact 
having an alt attributes on uh, an e-commerce site made. It made absolutely no difference. But this company, they could have been spending that energy doing other things rather than that. And I'm not saying alt attributes are useless, they're great for accessibility, but it shouldn't be an SEO's job. So we're at this point where the Google algorithm has become so complex over the last few years, and we are too biased. We've seen too many examples where we think this thing works, so we, uh, it's, de it's definitely going to work in this case or that case. So we need to start doing this better. What are companies doing about this? There's a few big companies that have started to realize they need to have a more data-driven approach to SEO. So Pinterest is the first one that comes to mind. They wrote a blog post about two years ago talking about the A-B testing that they were doing for SEO purposes. And they shared their results and the experiment that they did. And basically, it was a whole new way of doing SEO and thinking about it. Orbit, this is an interview with Aris Frakis, who now runs the team at Amazon, talking about the A-B testing, the split testing they've been doing. And then in the last couple of months, you might have seen Etsy have released a couple of blog posts showing the sort of uh, A-B testing they've been doing. So this is basically like, starting to become more and more established. It's really important. And so today, we're going to talk about how you can test. And at the end of this, I'm going to be giving away a free tool that basically will allow you to go away and start for essentially nothing, no, no cost, start doing split testing yourselves. But before we talk about that, you might want me to explain what split testing is when I mean split testing for SEO. So there's traditional split testing, things but like Optimizely, where people, so you say split testing or A-B testing, and most people start thinking about CRO and Optimizely style split testing. So in that model, Alexander and I might visit a website, and we might see a certain version of a product page. And then Marcus and Sandra might come to the same website, go to the same page, and see an alternative version of that page. There's differences. We do that for thousands of users, and we can measure which, group of, uh, which version of this page is better for conversion, which version of this page is actually getting more money, and then we can say, OK, let's keep that version or roll out the new version, depending upon what the results look like. For SEO, you can't do it like that because there's only one Google bot. We can't show it two different versions of pages. That'd be cloaking, and it'd get us in trouble. I don't know if John Muller's here. Um, so you want to avoid that. So rather than splitting users into two buckets, for SEO split testing, what we do is we split pages into two buckets. So imagine you've got an e-commerce site. Imagine you've got 1,000 product pages. They're all using the same template, and they've all got very similar content. What we do is we split those pages into two, two buckets. And in this scenario, Googlebot and myself and Alexander, we all see the same version of product A. But we all see the variation of product B. So we're not introducing new pages. We're not making new URLs. We're just modifying half of the pages with the change that we want to test. And really important to understand is that Googlebot sees exactly the same as users. Googlebot also sees the standard version of product, uh, of product A and the modified version of product B. So today I'm going to be talking about, I've got four sections to my presentation, talking about why and trying to convince you that SEO should be informed by data and tests. We should be moving towards this data-driven model where we can stop basically guessing. And I want to try to persuade you that we're not very good at that. We're going to be talking about some results from the SEO tests that we've been running at Distilled, and so you can understand the sort of results you might expect. Then I'm going to quickly run you through how you can do SEO testing yourselves, and we've got a free tool that we've built that is going to enable you to do that. Then I'll wrap all of this up at the end. So, 2009, cast your, back, your minds back to 2009, algorithm was really simple. There was no Panda, there was no Penguin, there was very little machine learning, there was no rank brain. We knew what to do. We basically had ranking factor studies, and we said, OK, for this site, we need more links. This site needs on-page changes. And we'd go away and we'd do that, and it was all, it was all good. And in those days, and until recently, Amit Singhal was head of search at Google. And this is really important because Amit's philosophy was that they should be crafting an algorithm that they could understand. He wanted that Google could look at a specific search engine results page, and they could understand why this specific URL ranked and this other one didn't. 
And a really interesting story uh, that gives you some insight into that is this comes from this blog, um, this post on Hacker News last year, where Kevin Lacker, who was one of the engineers on Amit's team, was trying to solve a problem with the search engine algorithm. And he was thinking about it, and he couldn't work it out. And he said, like, I was thinking about it as though it was a math puzzle. And if I just thought really hard, it would all make sense. And he was sat there trying to work out like a beautifully pure, mathematically consistent solution. When Amit walked in and said, why don't you just take the square root? And Kevin was like, I'm not squaring anything. Why would I take the square root? And Amit basically drew on the whiteboard and a sort of line like this. And he said, square root, logarithm, something that's got this sort of shape, I don't really mind. And Kevin said, it doesn't make any sense. I'm not squaring anything. And Amit replied, multiply it by two if it helps. Add five, whatever. We can make it make sense later on. He was more concerned with solving the problem in a pragmatic way that delivered the results he was looking for rather than it being this pure thing. But what we ended up with was an algorithm that was predominantly handmade. It was hundreds and hundreds of tweaks for different niches and different situations. And that was fine. But it made it quite difficult for us to understand. But at least if Google could understand it, there was a hope that we could understand it. But it became very complex. And then in early 2016, two things happened. Google changed their logo, which I'm not sure that affected the algorithm, but it might be related. And Amit Singhal retired. Recently, he's come out. He left under a bit of a cloud. But what's important to understand is that Amit leaving paved the way for a dramatic change. The guy who replaced him was John G. Andrea, who was previously the head of machine learning. And Amit had resisted having too much machine learning into the algorithm, because if you have machine learning, then it becomes very difficult to understand why certain things ranked. But now we had a guy who his whole focus was on using machine learning to improve Google products, take over the search algorithm. And a really interesting story about uh, the impact that machine learning can have on uh, any sort of Google product is the effect it had on the translation team. So the Google Translate product had been until yeah, had been around for about 10 years and had a couple of hundred engineers working on it. And in that time, they had made a huge improvement from in machine, learn, uh, machine translation from here. So they, they made a huge impact on the quality of that machine translation. And then three engineers from the machine learning team came in. And they were like, we'd like to help. And they looked at the problem, and they went away for two months, and they came back, and the progress that they had made in those two months, they made an algorithm that doubled the improvements. So there's 200 engineers who've been working for what turned out to be a very depressing 10 years, because then three guys rocked in and basically said, OK, we can do it twice as good as that using machine learning. So there was this, probably this awkward moment at Google headquarters where someone came out and was like, if you're on a translation team, just stop what you're doing. We're going to find something else for you to do. And imagine what would happen if we had got the same step change in the Google search algorithm as they got in the translation business. And so the search algorithm is much bigger, much more complex. But what we're looking at is a situation where machine learning can dramatically make dramatic improvements over this technology. But it has some side effects. So during my PhD, I did a PhD. I was doing a PhD in artificial intelligence. And during that, I programmed um, an artificial intelligence that would, I wasn't solving the world like Google World. It tried to play Pac-Man. And it felt important at the time. It was 2009. And so I had programmed this thing. And it's basically learned to play Pac-Man without knowing any of the rules. And then I encountered this strange scenario, and I spent two weeks trying to understand this and trying to fix it. And basically, what I observed was that there was the Pac-Man, there was the three ghosts in the world in my scenario, and Pac-Man would come out of his little nest, and then he'd just move back and forth, and he'd just stay waiting for one of the ghosts to come right to him. And at the very last moment, he'd run away, and the ghost would be right behind him the whole time. And I was like, why is he doing this? It doesn't make any sense. Where's the bug? And I was looking through the code trying to work this out. And in my, my uh, version of Pac-Man, when ghosts got to uh, crossroads, they would go left or right, depending. If there was equal distance to catch a Pac-Man, they would 
go one way or the other with a sort of probability. And my, my Pac-Man algorithm had learned that it was much easier for him to predict where one of the ghosts was if it was right behind him, because no long, there was no longer any probability involved. And he'd optimized it in a way that made no sense to me. So I spent two weeks, like a prat, trying to fix this problem. But actually, there wasn't a problem. It wasn't a bug. It was a feature. And this is really typical of machine learning algorithms. We see scenarios where it does things that are non-intuitive to humans, but are actually optimizations if you're from the machine learning perspective. And this is going to happen with the machine uh, learning creeping into the search algorithm. We're going to be looking at an algorithm where even to Google, it's not going to be capable, they're not going to be able to introspect the algorithm and understand why it's doing things it was doing, like they could when Amit was in charge. It's going to be doing things, and it's not even going to make sense to Google. So what sort of chance have we got? And so it's going to be really, really difficult for us to have any chance of predicting this. But I can see some of your faces, and you're probably already thinking this. You're like, Tom, I've been doing this for 10 years. I'm pretty fucking good at this. Don't you worry. I've got it covered. So we're going to test this. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to all stand up, and we're going to do an interactive quiz. And I'm going to show you, I've got three examples, and I'm going to show you a search query where, hang on a second. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to show you a, a search query, which we did uh, in Google, and I'm going to show, show you two pages that ranked in the top 10. So you already know a lot of the puzzle. You, and what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to vote on which one of these two pages you think ranked higher. I'm going to show you some statistics about them, and so you've got a good understanding of what's going on. And then we're going to see how good we are at understanding search results. So if everybody could stand up. Come on, don't be shy. Alexander as well, good. OK, anyone sitting down still I can pick on? Great. OK, so here's the first, first one. The search term is the future of TV advertising. That's what we typed into Google. And then the first page we've got is Advertising Age with uh, an article type titled Your Guide to the Future of TV, published in April 2016. And then the second example is the, from the Content Marketing Institute titled This Week in Content Marketing, the Future of Television Advertising is Native, also from April 2016. And then... I've got the, for each, I've got the Moz domain authority, I've got the page authority for that page, and the linking root domains for that page. OK, so have a moment, take it in, the future of TV advertising. So everybody who thinks that the advertising age ranked higher, put up your left arm. And if you think the Content Marketing Institute ranked higher, put up your right arm. Don't be shy. Has to be one arm or the other. OK, so if you put your right arm up, sit down, please. You're wrong. That was in position eight. <laughs> Stay standing if you got it right. And we're going to move on to the next example. Second example, the search was kettlebell technique. And we've got jensinkler.com with an article typed, fix your swing. And it's got a photo at the top, and it's got long form text. It's got 37 comments. And then we've got mensfitness.com, the perfect kettlebell swing. Master the form of the kettlebell swing to increase your explosiveness and build strength. It sounds exciting. OK, so here are the same, same metrics again. Take a moment, have a look. OK, so same thing again. If you think the top one, jensinkler.com, ranks higher, put your left arm up. If you think men's fitness, the bottom one, your right arm, please. One arm or the other, come on, commit. Don't be afraid. OK, so if you've got your right arm up again, sit down. There we go, some more. So one of the first things to notice is there's no consensus. We're the SEO experts. We haven't got a fucking clue. OK, final one. Do I need to back up my iPhone? So we've got Macworld, how to back up your iPhone or iPad, blah, 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 blah. May 16, we've got iDownload blog, what to do when there's not enough iCloud storage to back up your iPhone from 2013. Here are the metrics. Have a quick look. Make up your minds. OK, last one. Same deal again. Left arm for macworld.com, top one. Right arm for iDownloadBlog. OK, 
So if you've got your left arm up, sit down. So Dominic, you can sit down. You work for me. That's cheating. <laughs> Jono, sit down. You've seen this. Okay, so we've got what? One, two, three, four, five, six, six. Out of a room of how many people? We've got less than 10 of us standing up after just three. Okay, you can sit down now. Thank you. So the point here is that we, there's an equivalence between this task and if a client comes to you or your boss comes to you and they show you a specific search results page and they say, why is this page ranking higher than this one? And you look at the metrics and you do some evaluation and you run it through some tools and you're like, oh yeah, I'm an SEO, I've got some data. But I've shown you some data and turns out we're not very good at that. So how can we possibly know which data we should be tweaking if we just like ten, 10 of you have got a job still. The rest of you can just pack up and go home. There's no point in staying for the rest of the conference. I just don't know. And so how do we compare? I mean, maybe this is a bad bunch. Maybe you're inviting the wrong people to SMX Munich. I don't know. So we surveyed 2,000 people and asked them to do this same task for 10 queries. And we asked them to categorize themselves by level of SEO expertise. So lay people, OK, whatever. But junior SEOs do better than lay people. That's good. After a few years of practicing SEO, you get better at SEO. That's good. Senior SEOs do even better than junior SEOs. It'd be embarrassing if it wasn't the case. So that's pretty good as well. So everything's looking like it's trending in the right direction. What's next? Coin flip. OK, so. Yeah, I'm going to replace some of the distilled team with a, a, a two euro, one euro piece. Thank you. I say, so it turns out that this isn't a sort of problem that's confined to this room. It's just a really difficult task. And so, incidentally, we have a machine learning algorithm in the research team at Distilled that can do about this well. So soon we maybe will replace some of you. So what testing allows us to do is to stop guessing what worked. And every situation is different. This is showing when, what happened when we tested the same type of change on two different websites. Sometimes the same change doesn't really have any infect, uh, like impact. It looks like it goes down a bit, but not, not a lot. And other times it goes up. And so I'm hoping that I've persuaded you that testing is like, instrumental to the future of SEO, especially as machine learning comes in. So the case for testing. Predicting the effect of the algorithm is really, really hard, as it turns out. Some sites respond differently to the same things. Different niches, different products all respond differently. Machine learning is going to make this much, much worse than it's ever been before. And then finally, um, it allows you to optimize further than you ever did previously. So a lot of the um, clients that come to us for testing, basically, they start off with what we'd call very boring tests, maybe title tags and that sort of thing. Because previously, they got their title tags good enough and they had no real way of establishing whether tweaking those tags was going to make the situation any better or not. So I wanted to run you through some of the some results that we've had from tests that we've run so that you can understand the sorts of things you could be testing and changes you might get. So without being too salesy, at Distilled, my team developed a platform that allows you to do SEO split testing. So it does every part of like, the bucketing and makes the changes for you, et cetera. So all of the tests that we've been running, we've been running with the Distilled ODM platform. But at the end of this, I'm going to show you how you can be running tests that you don't need to be using our platform, and we're giving you away a free tool so you can start doing like a basic version of testing yourselves. And so I'm going to be showing you two graphs a lot. So I wanted to quickly show you how those work. So this is the first graph. And basically, you can treat the black line as the traffic to the test pages, the set of pages where we've made a change. And we can treat the blue line, for all intents and purposes, as being our control. So when the black line, the uh, actual traffic, is outperforming the blue line, we can see that, OK, it's outperforming the control. That means that this is a positive test. And then we've got a vertical line here, which shows this was a point where we rolled this test out. So beforehand, you would expect that the black line and the blue line broadly stay together, because nothing about them is any different. 
And then the, after the, the test rolls out, you might start to see them diverge, which we're seeing right on the, the right-hand side of this. We're seeing a black line outperforming the blue line. And then this is the second graph, and this shows the total additional sessions that we've got. So before you roll the test out, you're not getting any, any additional traffic. And once you roll the test out, if the test is positive, you'd expect to see uh, an improvement in the total cumulative traffic coming to your test pages since you started that test. And then we've got the shaded area, which is a 95% confidence interval. So basically, the dotted line shows the, the model and where it think, how much traffic it thinks you've got. But we've got a 95% confidence interval because there's some probabilities involved. And so the moment that the test becomes statistically significant is defined by that moment that the shaded area passes the zero line. OK. So and here, here they are together. OK, so the first test was the one I already alluded to earlier. We've all heard that out attributes on, on Im um, images should be fantastic for SEO. They should be something you should do. What we found is that basically there was no real impact to rolling those out. And so when you run tests, you probably think, oh, OK, we want to run tests that are positive. We want to be making the situation better. But running tests like this that are like neutral or null, these are also useful because they save you opportunity costs. If you know that there's no real point in you doing something, then it saves you time and resource to get something else done, especially if you're fighting for developer resource or anything, or you've got a finite amount of budget. It, saves, it helps you like dodge that situation. OK, number two. SEO content. So you all know what I'm talking about. We're talking about that 500 words of text that you've had written by a high-quality author from the best-selling list. And put it discreetly at the very bottom of the page, out of the way of users. And we do this because these pages don't have much text. And historically, we found or we thought we believed that it was going to allow Google to perform better and understand these pages better. So, OK, we wanted to test this. So this is the, what happened. We rolled it out. And you can see that the, we don't get statistical significance. It looks like it's trending downward a little bit, but it's not making a big difference. So this is another opportunity for us to save some money, maybe. OK, we can stop doing that for future products, because it's not helping you, really. But result number two, we tested this on a different site. And we found that the situation improved. We got a 3.1% improvement in organic search performance. Things got better when we removed that text. So not only did this give us something that we could go away and actually change, but it also means that we don't have to bother doing this writing in the future. We can, we can spend our energy and time and budget somewhere else. And the second thing that's interesting about this is that we've got two results here where we see different results once again for different sites. And that's something that we see more and more with testing. So we've been, we started building the platform at Distilled a couple of years ago. We rolled it out about a year ago. So we've been sort of doing more and more testing. And in the early days, I was of the belief that we should, there's some things that these are just best practice. We're good at SEO. We know that we should definitely do these things. And then there's other things we're not sure about. So we should test those things. But over the last year, I've come around to the way of thinking that we should just be testing everything, because there is no best practice. And that's going to be more of the case when we have a machine learning-based algorithm. And here we've seen like testing the same thing on different sites results in different um, uplift or not uplift or whatever happens. So one of the things that I've learned during the like, last year of testing is best practice is a fallacy. Like Every site is different. OK, so JavaScript rendering. So in May 2014, Google started to make noises that they were going to start crawling JavaScript. And a year and a half later, October 2015, they said, OK, we're actually going to turn off our Ajax like, backup crawling system, because we're just so confident that we can crawl JavaScript now. We don't need it. And so anecdotally, from what we've experienced at Distilled and from the conversations I've had at places like SMX Munich, we found that that's not necessarily true. We found that normally we get better results if we make sure that we, Google doesn't need to rely on JavaScript in any way to crawl the site completely and fully in order to understand it. 
but now we had an ability to actually go away and test this. So this was a test we did for a, a US-based client of ours called iCanvas.com. They sell canvas prints around, around the US. And on their category pages, they were using JavaScript to lay their products out in a sort of cool, funky fashion where they intermingled with one another, et cetera. But if you had JavaScript disabled, the, where the product lists should be, there was just nothing. And so we were of the idea, OK, well, if Google's not firing at JavaScript correctly, maybe, maybe Google doesn't realize what this page is all about. Maybe it doesn't, just thinks there's a big white gap there. So we actually tested it. We injected some CSS into those pages so that if you had JavaScript turned off, even though you didn't get the funky layout, you still got the product listing in a sensible fashion that was usable by users. And we saw a 6.2% uplift. Like, it was such a simple change. And the SEO team, like, we've been trying all different things, but such a simple change is just not relying on Google understanding that JavaScript actually led to this big improvement in performance. And so, as with the other results I've, like, I've caveated, this might not be the case for everyone. And that's one of the really important things that we've learned during testing as well, is that it allows you to stop playing this game of trying to work out what ranking factors are doing what things. But you can, if you start having like a pure test-based methodology or a, uh, a methodology that's predominantly test-based, then you don't have to worry about why is this thing ranking better, what ranking factor did we trigger. We just need to work out, OK, do we think this is going to be better? If so, let's test it. Oh, yeah, it's better. Let's roll that out, move on to the next thing. If it's negative, then let's roll it back. Fine. OK. So another classic uh, bit of SEO wisdom that I've heard sometimes is that, OK, well, we should make our title tags match the highest search volume terms that we've got. Makes, makes logical sense in an SEO's mind. But we tested this. We found that it was an 8% decrease. Because the way that people search in that sort of keyword-driven, predominantly for keyword-based desktop searches, the way that people search isn't necessarily very human readable. It doesn't necessarily lead to a good title tag. It makes for a good search term, but these are different things. And so the hypothesis is that we, we impacted click-through rates because these titles just didn't make as much sense to people in the search results. Uh, but once again, we don't need to worry about why. In this case, it was a negative test, so we roll it back. We go back to the old version. We typically take one or two weeks, we recover to back where we were, and then we can test the next thing, and we basically dodged a bullet. So the final example I wanted to show you was, I don't know how I'm doing for time. I haven't got a timer here. Um, we have, let's say, 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes, OK. Uh, well, eight so, more. Eight more? Seven. <laughs> so structured markup on category pages, the final example I wanted to show you. So category pages have lots of image, but not a lot of text. So we might be tempted to squeeze those 500 words down at the bottom, or we might be tempted to try and think about this in a different way. And so what we decided to test was we test whether adding structured markup per product. So there are 40 products on the pages that we were running a test on. And we, the, the hypothesis was that having structured markup for every one of those, having a list of structured markup, would make it clear there's a list of these items rather than like on a product page where you're marking up one. And so, relatively like, simple idea. Let's test it. This was one of our most successful tests to date. We got an 11% uplift in organic traffic. And so you can see like, it's a really consistent test. Like, we got statistical significance relatively early on. But we, they wanted to deploy it on their back end rather than using our platform. And so while they're waiting, we let the test keep running. And you can see this is very consistent. That gradual increase just shows that the test set of pages are just consistently outperforming the control set of pages. And it led to 11% uplift. And so you can see that they were doing between 20,000 and 30,000 organic sessions per day to this set of pages. And this was an e-commerce site, so it was relatively simple for us to look at the numbers and work out what a typical organic session landing on these money pages was worth to them in terms of revenue, and actually calculate. And this was making them over £100,000 more per month once they rolled it out. And this was the first, this was so exciting to me as an SEO, because this is the first time that 
as SEOs, we were able to truly prove the exact value of the work that we've been doing. And this has been a frustration. It was a frustration for me when I was on the consulting side of Distilled because we would fight for resource and other people, the PPC team, would be able to prove their exact ROI. And it was intensely frustrating. Now, we felt like we were, having, we were doing good work as well, but we couldn't demonstrate it to a business and the people in the C-suite didn't necessarily believe us. Whereas this, when you can actually say, yeah, we're making £100,000 a month, can we have a bit more money to do some more of this stuff, please? It becomes far more compelling. Okay, so I've probably got four minutes left, five minutes left. So how can you run these tests yourselves? There's three main steps to running do-it-yourself split tests. Firstly, you need to create two buckets of pages. These are two sets of pages. They need to be using the same template so, and they have similar content. Product pages, category pages, article pages, location pages. It doesn't just need to be e-commerce sites. We've been testing across publishers and other types of uh, other niches as well. Number two, make a change to all pages in one bucket. So this is where you actually make the change that you want to test, and you just change half of the pages, um, all the pages in one of your buckets. And then finally, analyze which bucket performs better. And that's where our free tool is going to kick in. So step one. So um, and on the final slide of this, and right after I get off stage, I'll tweet out the link to the deck. And that will include uh, these links through, so you don't worry about getting the links right now. But the, I link here to the, the instructions on creating GA segments, if you've not done that before. So you can basically use Google Analytics to create two batches of pages. Step one, relatively easy. So now we've got our two buckets. Step two. Oh, sorry. So I should say, you want to make sure that you aim, if possible, for about 1,000 organic sessions per day in each bucket. You can test below that limit, and that's fine, and you can do a relatively sort of pragmatic interpretation. This is already going to be data that you didn't have before, but we find about 1,000 organic sessions per day is where we start to become more robust to like flux in the rankings, etc. So step two, make a change to all the pages in one bucket. And this is the hardest part of the whole thing. You need to have some scalable way of doing this. And there's various different plugins and et cetera that you can use for different CMSs to make these changes. Just talk to your dev, buy them beer, do whatever you need to do to make that part happen. And that's definitely the hardest part. But for small groups of pages, if you've got pages with high enough traffic, you can basically do this manually by just going in and making changes to individual pages that you know are in your test bucket. And then finally, you want to analyze which bucket performs better. So we've built a tool where you can basically take the daily traffic to each of your buckets, which you're going to pull from your GA segments. You just paste it all into this tool, and it'll do like an analysis for you. It's using a simplified version of the maths that we use in the distilled ODM platform. And it'll basically help you understand and interpret that data for you. So. Final thing is that you should run these experiments for probably two or three weeks is typical in order to get um, significance. Some tests go faster, some tests take a bit longer. And then once you roll out a test, you probably want to wait two or three weeks before you start the next test and so that Google crawls the, the changes you made to the control pages as well. There's links in the deck to two blog posts, which you'll find useful. This one by Will Critchlow talks about high level A-B testing. Um, like the concepts of it, et cetera. And then this blog post by Dominic, who's sat over here, so you grab him after the, the presentation as well if you want to talk about this stuff, talks you basically through the step-by-step -step, uh, process for doing this yourselves. So in summary, split testing is becoming more necessary. You're all basically a coin flip when you try to do this manually. Split testing is becoming more established. The big companies are starting to do this, and it might be tempting for you to think that you can't do it, but we've built a tool, you can do this. This is really accessible. So split testing makes you more credible internally in any organization, whether you're an agency side or in-house. If you can actually demonstrate the ROI of your SEO work by showing a graph that shows the uplift in organic traffic, or even better, in revenue, then you're going to find it a lot lot easier to start getting more buy-in, more resource, more budget, more dev time, et cetera, et cetera. It's becoming more accessible. It's already accessible. You can grab this tool, and it's already up online, and you can start doing this straight away. And I, I, 
don't want to be overly dramatic, but this is, a, this is literally like a step change. It's a completely huge improvement in the way that most of us are able to do SEO. Like having this data-driven approach can absolutely make such a significant difference to everything you've been doing. And you're all going to go back after this conference, and you're going to have loads of cool ideas from all the good speakers who have been up here. And all of these changes are all going to be positive changes. But this, like, this is like, I sound like a twat, so like, listen to me, but not them. But this is actually a whole new way of doing SEO that is completely open to you and just makes such a huge difference. Once you start doing it, once you have seen some of the results, it's so hard to go back to the old way of just not having an understanding. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank Dominic and Will, who both helped and collaborated on this deck. Thank you. A very interesting presentation. Very depressing. Very depressing. Yeah, because we... Sorry. Uh, yeah, because we're all living out uh, of our knowledge to say, ah, oh, this works, and we're talking yeah. internally and say, oh, look. Um, so the, the quiz part is depressing. And the depressing thing is, like, I helped make the quiz, and I still get it wrong half the time. It's like, really depressing in that case. So. Yeah. Um, maybe one question before we go okay. into our evening keynote, and I see Will and Rand standing over there. But... Um, Somebody was asking me, so actually we can rid of all the expensive tools now, because everything what's written in there is maybe, yeah, maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. S repeat that question. So the else. question was, so uh, should we now get rid of all the tools? And well, we say, well, in no, search console, that's not of interest, because if they say missing titles, and we say yes. Ab absolutely not. So you shouldn't get rid of the other tools that you're using, because Anything like, and as I said right early on in my like, introducing section one, like SEO should be informed by data. And so split testing is a source of data. There's loads of other sources of data, all the tools you have. And as much as like, I've, I've demonstrated that it is actually more difficult for us to predict exactly how the search results rank. Like we have been doing successful SEO for the last couple of decades, and so having SEO uh, tools that can give you information, they should be driving your hypothesis rather than your action. So keep doing everything you've been doing, but rather than just act on it straight away, let that drive, OK, we think this is what we should be doing, and then test it. And that's the key difference. It should drive, drive hypothesis rather than action. Yeah. Super. So then, once again, thanks very much. Thank you Tom, very much. Super presentation. Beware thanks. of the Schnurzenkel. <laughs> <laughs>